Welcome to another edition of Coonrod's Corner. Today's topic, expectations of band pass microwave filters. Now here's your host, John Coonrod. Hello, welcome to Coonrod's Corner. My name is John Coonrod. I am a technical marketing manager for Rogers Corporation. Today I'm going to be talking about a bandpass filters. This is going to be a simple tutorial of microwave bandpass filters. In the past I have done another Coonrod's Corner on a similar topic that was an overview of filters. And uh, it may be good to take a look at that previous Coonrod's Corner before viewing this video today. The title of that previous Coonrod's Corner is Basic Tutorial of Microwave PCB Based Filters. So with that, let's go ahead and get started and talk more specifically about bandpass filters and let's look at an ideal response of a bandpass filter shown here. The graph shown here is an ideal bandpass filter and uh, the x-axis is frequency and the y-axis is loss. The loss is in dB. And you can see that there's three distinct regions here and the region of frequencies from 0 to F1 is considered a stop band. So basically the filter is stopping energy from going through the filter in this region. And the reason it's doing that is because insertion loss is so high at 80 dB of loss there's no energy that's going to go through that filter. And then at F1 you have a uh, cutoff frequency where it cuts off and jumps from the stop band up to the pass band. And now in the pass band range of frequencies which is F1 to F2 uh, and centered at F sub 0 in that range of frequencies, there is very little insertion loss, and in an ideal case shown here, there's zero loss. So that means all the energy at those frequencies will pass through. So that's considered the passband of this filter. And then if you move to the F2 frequency and beyond that, it transitions back down again to having very high insertion loss, 80 dB. And the amount of energy that could be transferred through this filter is pretty much zero, so that's a stop band. So a bandpass filter does, as the name implies, it's got a band of frequencies that passes energy through, but it also has two stop bands. It has a stop band to the left and right of the bandpass. So in reality, the insertion loss itself does look a little different than that. That is an idealized type of uh, bandpass filter. So now let's take a look at a more realistic depiction of a bandpass filter shown here. The bandpass filter shown here is, uh, you can see from 0 to F1 in the stop band that it doesn't have that flat and abrupt response as it does in the ideal scenario and it has some curvature and that's actually normal for a bandpass filter for the stop band to be shaped like that. And then in the pass band region from F1 to F2 you can see there's a slight slope and that's also correct where over a wide range of frequencies the insertion loss will increase and that's normal. And then to the right of that, F2 is another cutoff frequency, and that goes out to the stop band down to about 50 dB of loss. And 50 dB of loss in the real world is considered a very good loss, and that means that the uh, filter is shutting off any energy from going through those frequencies. So the stop band looks very well behaved. Until you get out a little farther in frequency, about 2 f naught, or basically 2 times the center frequency, now you start seeing the insertion loss changing and increasing and becoming better actually and letting energy through when it really should not. So this is anomaly in the stop band that is not desired and it's typically called a spurious harmonic resonance peak and that can cause problems in the stop band. Some of the reasons why the uh, insertion loss of a bandpass filter is not ideal is because they are designed with transfer functions. There are many different types of transfer functions, but basically what these transfer functions do, there are mathematical expressions uh, that show how the insertion loss will behave in the pass band and in the stop band. There are many different types of transfer functions, but there are typically four that are used most often. And these four are the Chebyshev, Butterworth, Elliptic, and Gaussian. And we will talk about each one of them in the uh, illustration shown here. Here I've shown two different bandpass filters, one that is designed with the Chebyshev transfer function and another to the right which is designed with the Butterworth transfer function. In the case of the Chebyshev transfer function, you can see in the passband region there are ripples and that's indicative of the Chebyshev transfer function. But also what goes along with that is a very good transition from the stop band to the pass band. And that transition is very crisp and very sharp here where it occurs over a very small range of frequencies and that's what's desired for a good filter design. The ripples is not necessarily a good thing, but the very sharp transition from the stop band to the pass band is a good thing. So as with most engineering, there's always trade-offs. Now in the case of the Butterworth design, you can see that the pass band is very smooth and really without ripples. And if I would have drew it a little bit more accurately, what you would find is the Butterworth would actually have a little bit lower loss than the Chebyshev. The trade-off here though is the Butterworth does not have that abrupt change from stop band to pass band and that transition actually occurs over a wider range of frequencies so it's not quite as well 
uh, developed as the Chebyshev function. The elliptic function is somewhat similar to the Chebyshev where you have ripples in the pass band, but also, which is not shown here, the elliptic function will also have ripples in the stop band. But the benefit to the elliptic transfer function is that the transition from the stop band to the pass band is very abrupt, and it's just about ideal. So that's another one of the trade-offs. The Gaussian is more similar to the Butterworth, where the transition from the stop band to the pass band is stretched across a wide range of frequencies, which is not really desired. However, the Gaussian gives you the benefit of having very flat group delay in the pass band area, as well as very flat uh, phase response. So how do you make a bandpass filter with PCB technology? Uh, essentially what's done is a resonator is developed first for the, the center frequency that's desired, and then these resonators are cascaded together to form the filter function. Now in the case of bandpass filters, there's a lot of different things that have been done in the past for resonator structures. One of the more common ones is a microstrip edge coupled bandpass filter, and that's really taking a strip that's about a half wavelength long and having it very close proximity to another strip that's a half wavelength long, and energy coupled between them, and that acts as a filter function. There's other uh, type of resonators as well. There's ring resonators, there's square resonators. There's quite a variety of things that can be used to develop this transfer function, which ultimately turns into a bandpass filter. In the picture shown here, the top view is a microstrip edge coupled bandpass filter, and in this case, you can see there are four coupled elements. So in this case, they would say this filter is an N4 filter, four coupled resonator elements that develop and form this bandpass filter. Now below this, I've given an illustration of a similar design that's actually used in materials of two different dielectric constant. And the smaller circuit actually has the same filter function as the larger circuit. But the smaller circuit's actually designed on a material with a higher dielectric constant, about 10.2. And because of that, the physical size of the filter shrinks down because the higher dielectric constant actually makes a shorter wave. Now let's take a look at a edge couple microstrip bandpass filter and this particular case is designed to have a center frequency about 1.88 gigahertz and having a stop band region of about 0 to 1.75 gigahertz and about 2.05 gigahertz on out. In this picture you can see that the stop band is actually very well behaved so we have a very high insertion loss in the stop band region on the low frequency side and the high frequency side so basically what that means is the energy is being completely shut off from 0 hertz to about 1.75 to 1.8 gigahertz or so and then the passband region starts and the passband region is around 1.8 gigahertz to 2 gigahertz and then around 2.05 to 2.09 that's when the stop band on the right side of the higher frequency uh, kicks in and goes out as far as we do in this case, which is just 3 gigahertz. So this particular filter would be very good to use for application that's centered around 1.8, 1.9 gigahertz, and also very good to use if there is a uh, application in the neighboring area of about 3 gigahertz because the stop band is so well behaved in that region of frequencies. This concludes this session of Coonrod's Corner. Thank you for watching. Cool. For additional information and technical tools, if you're not already a member, join the Rogers Technical Support Hub and gain access to calculators, technical papers, and more Rogers Corporation informational videos. Rogers Technical Information is also available at your fingertips with the Rog mobile app, available for the iPhone, iPad, and Android devices. Check it out today.